The Bible. It's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how He created us and loves us so much that He made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. Now, for an amazing story, inspired by the book of 2 Kings, chapter 5. Naaman was the commander of the army of Aram, one of Israel's greatest enemies. Forward, march! Though Naaman was a wealthy man, he had one problem that no doctor could solve. He had a terrible skin disease. Oh, ah, make it go away. Then Naaman heard news of a prophet in Israel, Elisha, who might be able to help. But instead of going straight to Elisha, Naaman took rich gifts to the king of Israel, along with a letter from the king of his own land explaining how important he was. The king of Israel frowned as he read the letter from his enemy, the king of Aram. I am sending my servant Naaman to you with this letter. I want you to heal him of his skin disease. What? N no! I I I'm not God. Your king is trying to pick a fight with me. But I, I just no, want- No, this thing, not this thing. La, 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 la. The king of Israel made such a fuss that Elijah heard the news and sent a messenger. It was probably his trusted servant, Gehazi. I am a good guy. Trust me. Gehazi took Elisha's message to the king. Elisha says, tell the man to come to me. Gehazi raced back home to help Elisha prepare for the important visitor. And sure enough, the king of Israel sent Naaman straight to their doorstep. <laughs> Gehazi he peeked out the window. Look how low the chariot is riding. What's in the back? Embroidered robes and bags of something? Gehazi. Hurry up, you gotta look good for this guy. I'll, I'll get you your best robe. Nope. You're not wearing the robe? I'm not going out. Not going out? No, you are. But my robe? What's wrong with your robe? It's old. It's not even a decent name brand like Melchizedek or Queen Jezebel. Elisha sent his servant out the door with a message for Naaman. Are you the prophet? Uh, no. But l let me just say that is one excellent chariot. I, I see you got the golden hubcap. Where's Elisha? He says, go, wash yourself in the Jordan River seven times. Then your skin will be healed. You will be pure and clean again. Oh, I thought Elisha would come out himself. I know, right? Look, can't he just say some words and wave his hand and, you know, make me better? That's what I was thinking, too. Oh, and the Jordan River? I mean, it's full of muck and tadpoles and... Oh, forget it. Naaman tore off, angry but his servants convinced him to follow Elisha's instructions. Naaman dipped seven times in the murky Jordan River, and when he rose from the water on his seventh time, what? His skin was perfectly clean. He was healed. Unbelievable. Naaman raced back to Elisha's home. This time, the prophet came outside along with Gehazi. Naaman marveled at his unmarked arms and hands. Now I know that there is no God anywhere except in Israel. Please take a gift from me. Gehazi inched closer to the chariot. He could see the richly colored robes hanging over the bags of gold and silver. Is that a genuine Melchizedek robe? Uh-huh, the real deal. Just have your servants unload around back and I'll... Nope. I serve the Lord. You can be sure that he lives. And you can be just as sure that I won't accept a gift from you. What? Please, I'm begging you. He's begging you, Elisha. But Elisha still refused to take a single coin from Naaman and send him away in peace. Elisha went back inside, leaving Gehazi speechless on the doorstep. What? No, seriously? Gehazi could still see the dust kicked up by the horse's hooves. Elijah should have taken something. If he didn't want it, he could have just given it to me. With that, Gehazi took off running down the road. His arms pumped and his sandals flapped as he crested the hill and came up alongside the chariot. Naaman pulled it to a halt. Is everything all right? 
It's fine. Fine. <sighs> well, I, uh, master sent me to say that uh, 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 two young prophets have come to visit. Yeah, yeah, that, that's it. Uh, please give them 75 pounds of silver and two sets of clothes. Oh, of course. Take twice as much. Naaman's servants carried the heavy bags of silver and clothing back up the road, but as they approached Elisha's house... Hey, thanks! <laughs> I got it from here. Straining beneath the weight of his heavy load, Gehazi snuck inside and stashed the clothing and silver in his room. Then he hurried back out and strolled through the front door. <laughs> <laughs> Can't whistle. Elisha studied him with sharp eyes. Where have you been? Oh, me? I didn't go anywhere. Didn't my spirit go with you? I know Naaman greeted you. I know you took money and clothes. I was just being nice to the horses, making their load lighter. You and your family after you will have Naaman's skin disease. But th then I can't wear my new robes. Sure enough, Gehazi's skin was soon covered with sores, just like Naaman's was. Gehazi's lie had won him some new clothes, but it had cost him Elisha's trust and a full and healthy life. Hi, True Kids, my name is Miss Destiny. God's words tells us to think on things that are good, lovely, kind, pure. Now, when we set our mind on things, on these things, they are pleasing to God. Now, our hearts, are what's in our hearts, what, what we think on determine what's in our hearts, and our hearts determine our actions. And when that happens, um, we wanna be sure that we're thinking on things that are kind and that are pleasing to God. Now, if we think on things that are you know, maybe are scary or frightful or, you know, mean or anything like that, then there's a good, then th we know that those things are not pleasing to God and we shouldn't be thinking on those things. But if we think on things that are good, we'll, we're more likely to experience the joyfulness of God. All right. So it's like this. We have our good balloon, which, you know, with God, when we think on God things, we experience God's joy, his peace, his kindness, and all that good stuff. Now, when we, when we also have our red balloon. Now, when we think on things that are maybe fearful, hateful, mean, um, then, you know, those things are not of God. And they, talk, they can cause us to do things that are not so good and maybe make bad decisions, okay? So it's kind of like this. When, if we continuously feed, are if we continuously feed lies or things that are not pleasing to God, like fear or, you know, maybe things that we believe about ourselves or others that aren't true, we tend to um, make that thing bigger, right? And so what happens is that we, it's kind of like we maximize it and it becomes a lot bigger than it should. And that's not what God wants. God doesn't want us to think on things that are not pleasing to him. He doesn't want us to walk in fear. He doesn't want us to um, set our minds on things that don't glorify him. But what we can do, because we can only feed one thing at a time, is that we can make a decision to focus on things that are pleasing to God. And so what will happen is that if we stop focusing on bad things, this, for instance, this balloon will probably deflate. Sorry, I didn't know what to do. But if we focus on the good things, we will feed things like joy, kindness, and gentleness and peace. And not only that, it's much easier to walk in love when we focus on those things. And so before we know it, we're thinking on things that are of God and that are pleasing to him. And, and, and as a response, we tend to make better decisions and tend to do good things when we think on things that are pleasing to God, okay? So, you see in our hearts and our, you see in our hearts and our thoughts, so pretty much if we focus on things that are pleasing to God, we're feeding on those good things. 
So when we focus on things that are pleasing to God, we tend to focus on the good and it tends to grow. And as a response, our hearts become happier and we are walking in joy and get to experience the fullness and the love of God and also extend it to others. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray for us. Father God, I pray that you would help us to walk in love and to think on things that are pure, lovely, kind, joyful, and to be gentle. I pray that we would not accept those things and not believe the things and not feed the things that are not pleasing to you, like sadness and fear and anger and hatefulness. Please help us to focus on what is good and to live a life that is glorifying to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, what's up, True Kids? It's Mr. Fernando, and I'm here to go through the memory verse with you kids. And if you remember it, let's see if we can get it done the first try. It's from Proverbs 10, 9. Anyone who lives blame, without blame walks safely, but anyone who takes a cricket path gets caught. All right, let's try it again. Let's get some energy flowing. All right. It's from Proverbs 10, 9. Anyone who lives without blame walks safely, but anyone who takes a cricket path gets caught. All right, we're gonna go through it one last time. I need you guys to get up, give me some energy. Let's go, all right. So it's from Proverbs 10, 9. Anyone who, walk, who lives without blame walk safely, but anyone who takes a cricket path gets caught. Thank you, kids. Elisha's servant Gehazi told some lies, didn't he? He lied to himself, saying he needed more stuff than he already had. He lied to Naaman to get the stuff. Then he lied to Elisha about all of it. Maybe Gehazi wasn't a bad guy, but would you be able to trust somebody like that? Never! What if someone lied to you? What if they said they were going to keep a secret, but they let it slip out? Or if they said they'd do one thing, but then did something else instead? Do you still trust them? Oh no! It's harder to trust people after they've let you down, right? Correct! It works the same way when we're the ones who tell the lie or don't do what we say we'll do. It can make us come across as the villain. So. Here's the one very important thing to remember. When you're not truthful, you lose trust. When you are truthful, you're the hero! And if you need even more evidence that being truthful is the way to go, look to Jesus. He always did exactly what he said he would do. He can be trusted no matter what. That's what I want to be. What do you say, Buckethead? Will you turn from your villainous ways? Do I get to keep the bucket? Sure. It's a deal! Great! Go be heroes, everyone! Bye! Hey, Buckethead, how do you feel about tacos?